Unless you are one of the one in three people on the planet experiencing a daily water shortage, you probably don't think much about what it takes to bring clean and plentiful supplies of water to your tap. This edition of Nature Inc. will change that as we go to the desert of the Middle East, the High Andes and the Big Apple. And we find there might be no water shortage, even in the desert, if supplies are managed within nature's limits. Welcome to Nature Inc., a new series that's about the economy of nature. For 200 years, the free market has dominated global economic thinking, but it left something vital off the books, the services nature provides to the whole human race. In 2003, scientists valued those services at $33 trillion a year. Nature Inc. asks what would happen if governments and big business had to pay for what nature provides us for free. New York City, unofficial consumer capital of the world. Here, money rules and everyone's on the hustle. Nothing is for free, but water comes close. All this economic activity is dependent on clean water supplied by the city's main watershed. But getting it to New Yorkers in the quantity and the bargain prices they have become accustomed to is entirely due to sound planning and management. You're talking about eight or nine million people living in a very small area that does not have uh, a source of water locally that could provide uh, for the city. New York uses an amazing five billion liters of water a day. That's 2,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Alex Matheson is the executive director of Riverkeeper, a charity set up to protect New York's water supply. A lot of New Yorkers don't even know where their water comes from. They certainly don't understand quite how important it is and what the threats to it are. 90% of it comes from the Catskill Mountains, nearly 200 kilometers north of the city. On these hillsides, gravity gets to work as plentiful rainfall filters first through forest, then trickles through mosses, topsoil, and porous rocks. It's an ecosystem service that would cost billions of dollars to copy. Water has a chance to age, to settle out, and to purify it naturally so that by the time it reaches the city, it's a very high quality. At the high-tech labs of the City Water Authority, water quality is monitored constantly. We analyze for over 50 different water quality parameters, and we generally find that our water is very clean. So all of these things combined um, have allowed us to receive a waiver for filtration from the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency. That waiver is the city's jackpot. By federal law, every city in the US must maintain high water standards. Usually this means building and running expensive filtration plants. According to the City Environment Authority, man-made filtration would cost 10 times more. We've probably spent a billion and a half dollars in the watershed over the past 10 years or so to keep the water clean. But in fact, if we had to build a filtration plant for 90% of our water, we would have to spend $10, $12 billion doing that. And then the last time we estimated, we thought it would cost us about $100 million a year just to operate it. There are strict environmental controls in the Catskills, but New York's other watershed, the East Hudson River Valley, has more development and pollution. The valley is the source of 10% of New York's supply, but it's failed to meet federal standards. So now the city authorities estimate they've got to lay out up to $3 billion to build a filtration plant. Suddenly, water rates in New York City as a result of this filtration plant are definitely going to increase. If you have to actually treat the problem once it's already occurred, it's always far, far more expensive uh, to do that than to simply not pollute in the first place. The Catskills watershed covers an area of over 3,600 square kilometers. That's around 60 times the size of Manhattan. It's mainly forest and fields, but starting at the end of the 1970s, 
industrial and residential land use began increasing and the watershed came under threat. From 1991, the state of New York embarked on an ambitious scheme to conserve it. Protecting water at its source might be an easier thing to do if the watershed itself was uninhabited. New York City's watershed is a living watershed. 70,000 people live in the prime Catskills watershed. To protect the water supply, some of the strictest environmental regulations in the USA are applied here, limiting fertilizer and pesticide use and industrial pollution. In return, the locals get $100 million in investment. We are helping a, a community that frankly has been economically struggling for a long time in return for helping us to, to, to preserve the areas and provide nine million people with their drinking water. So a protected nature has given New Yorkers water bills which are lower than the average for a US city, despite it being one of the most expensive cities in the world. For the authorities that supply clean water to water guzzling New Yorkers, the $100 million price tag is a mere snip. Through this natural investment, the city provides water at seven cents a litre, almost half the cost in Atlanta. In all likelihood, the vast majority of New Yorkers never give this example of good governance of nature a passing thought. People say to me, water, it's rain, it should be free, just like the air. And, and really, when you think about it, polluted air is free. Clean air takes a lot of planning and a lot of investment. And the same thing is true with water. To keep it clean takes a lot of planning and investment. New York is an example of what sound management can achieve when working with communities and the ecology to save money. But valuable watersheds lie in countries with much less money, less political stability, and less technological know-how than the world's superpower. Ecuador is a water-rich nation with three times the international average amount of fresh water per person. But incredibly, Quito, the capital city, is still at risk of experiencing severe water shortages by 2025. That's because, say water experts Nature Inc. has talked to, the authorities are neglecting one of its best assets, the Paramo. It's the name for the watershed on the slopes of the Andes, one of the most biodiverse places on Earth. This is where the water of the Amazon is being born. Let us come inside of the highest rainforest we can find on Earth. Because of the high air humidity, mosses go very well. Those mosses as such catch in the mist and also retain it, and it passes through the cloak of mosses to the soil. Pull a little bit out, water peaks out of, that, of those mosses. In effect, the Paramo is a giant 14,000 square kilometer natural sponge, four times bigger than the Catskills. It absorbs, then releases abundant clean water for free. It's the main source of water for the two million people in Quito. But Ecuador has a history of economic and political turbulence. And one of the fallouts has been a neglect of the watershed, with potentially disastrous consequences, according to the country's leading water NGO. Everything we have done in the past few decades has not worked. The system of government over the watershed has been deficient. It's been weak and complicated. 27,000 people live on the Paramo in Ecuador, and their farming is damaging the watershed. And Quito's population is expanding fast leaving it at risk of running short of water in 20 years. So the government is planning to build a giant dam instead of relying on the Paramo. Quito has been doubling its population every 25 years. That means that in the next 25 years, we have to carry out many projects, just like in the past. The dam would divert 28 rivers that help feed the Amazon and use them to supply Quito with water. It will cost around $1.2 billion, which for a city and an economy like ours is a very large investment. The dam is facing legal challenges from communities in the Amazon who fear it will reduce the flow to the Great River. But is such an expensive dam really necessary? 
The government itself estimates that up to 65% of Quito's water is wasted through leaks and mismanagement. According to the UN, that makes Quito the city with one of the highest per capita water uses in Latin America. To the conservation lobbyists, the answer is obvious. Use some of the money that would be spent on the Rios Orientales Dam on stopping the wastage and protecting the Paramo. Instead of the Rios Orientales with their um, environmental impact, we can also invest to make sure that the demand per capita decreases. Some experts believe that if Quito reduced its water wastage, Ecuador could follow Catskill's model. It could compensate the 27,000 people living on the Paramo and guarantee a clean and cheaper water supply for Quito. Professor Felipe Cisneros is a water resources expert advising the Latin American equivalent of the World Bank.